taking the time. I believe, I believe there's over 50 of us here to continue this dis important discussion about equity. I know you will be talking about equitable syllabi and looking at the equity dashboard. Uh, your continued involvement in, in this work is so important and you're carving out the time out of your schedule to engage in these important conversations that only benefit our students. You know, I've been thinking a lot about equity. I've been thinking about it within the context of equity as celebration, a celebration of our students and what we need to do to help our students meet their potential. And let me give you an example of how we're working together to do that. The campus came together to find a location for the Black Student Union. The faculty worked together, the folks that built LACCD, the folks at facilities, all had a common goal to try to find a location for these students where they would feel welcome and valued. And we were able to do that. So that came about because of you all's attitudes about equity, about the importance of every student and the importance of our roles as educators. So thank you for spending the time together this morning on this important subject. Thank you, Leslie, for continuing to put together these great workshops. And I hope that everybody leaves feeling that their time was well spent, that you had the opportunity to engage in important conversations. More importantly, that you are reminded of the, of the fundamental role that we're playing right now through our shared governance process, through equity um, uh, conversations like this, and through just choosing to be together as educators at this important time. So the best to each of you and have a great meeting. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And if you're just making it into the room today or right now, I'm gonna flash this little prompt. Um, later in the day, we're going to go into breakout rooms according to our division. And so it'll be helpful for us to group uh, folks together. Um, if you rename yourself, uh, with your division kind of at the, at the front of your name. Uh, our classified colleagues, you can uh, write classified and you'll be um, in a room together. And then for our, our administrators um, who are with us today, um, you get to choose um, if you want to go into a breakout room um, with folks uh, over a division that you, um, or with a division that you oversee, you can go ahead and do that. Um, or you can join the classified, uh, the classified folks. Okay, before we start talking about equity and um, document review and all of that, I wanna show you uh, what we have planned for today. Um, we're gonna start with the warm, act, warm up activity, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, we're going to look at the student survey from last semester, and um, we have used the survey to organize today's activities, just like we did for leadership retreat uh, last, last semester. The bulk of our time is uh, going to be spent um, in breakout rooms, again, with your divisions. Faculty will be doing a, an equitable syllabus checklist or review and um, classified professionals will be uh, taking uh, place in the document review. And then we'll come back together for some final thoughts, realizations, aha moments, and a uh, break for the day. So for the warm up activity, um, this is a trick that I learned from Marini and she's gonna help uh, facilitate this portion. Um, she, I think she calls it a waterfall. You, I might have had you do it in a, in a previous um, workshop. Um, so I'm going to have a series of questions and you're going to use the chat to type your response, but you won't hit enter until I give you the cue to hit enter. And that will allow all of our responses to show up in the chat at the same time. And so since we haven't seen each other in a while, I just wanna know, how's it been? How are you? Okay. So first question, don't hit enter quite yet. I'll let you know when you can hit enter. So go ahead and start using the chat. 
Um, and you're gonna use an emoji uh, and select the emoji that best represents how you're feeling right now. Let's give you 15 seconds to figure that out. Okay, you can go ahead and press enter. <laughs> okay, see some sleepy emojis, some excited emojis, some uh, sick emojis. Sorry for anyone who's not feeling well today. Um, does anyone want to un, um, unmute themselves and explain why they chose the emoji that they that they posted? It's a bright, shiny morning, shiny morning. So with the sun, you can't go wrong. I mean, you have to be excited. It's a nice day. Thanks, Caleb. Totally <laughs> grateful for the morning and uh, grateful to be here with you all. Anyone else want to unmute themselves and explain why you chose your emoji? I am oh, happy to be here. I chose the neutral because I'm happy to be here. Um, and good morning to everybody. It's a beautiful day in LA. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking all the things that I need to do for my students during these first few weeks. Definitely. I feel that. I taught winter, so grades are due today. And um, a lot of us just started sure. with our classes in the spring. So um, yeah, I see Vered saying stress, overworked, but also excited. So a multitude of emotions happening this morning. Um, Marini, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Okay, so we're going to do the same process, the waterfall, where everyone will type your answer into the chat, but refrain from hitting enter until I give you the three, two, one countdown, just so that we can see everyone's responses at once. And this keeps us from, you know, being swayed by other folks' answers or from, you know, not being able to focus on our own answer because we're reading everyone else's responses. So then you can just kind of be present and immerse in thinking about what you did over winter break. And then we can have the fun to scroll and see everyone's answers when they hit enter simultaneously. So for this next prompt, describe a fun activity that you did over winter break. And if your winter break was nothing fun, you can't think of anything fun, maybe you can write down something fun that you would have liked to do. So give you about 20 seconds to think and write, and then we will hit enter momentarily. So something fun that you did or would have liked to do over winter break. And don't hit enter just yet. Not just yet. <laughs> About 10 more seconds. Okay, and I'm gonna count down from three, two, one, and then say enter, ready? Three, two, one, enter. <sighs> wow. So many cool it. Hawaii. I know it's, it's a very cool visual. Rock climbing, Magic Castle. I went to the Magic Castle too. Ooh. Allison, hiking, lots of hiking. Going to the snow, watching romantic comedies, always fun. Two week vacation. Oh, so nice. Reading books, hanging with family. <sighs> buying plants Ate all left. the food <laughs> Just so much food love it got got a new dining room table that's very exciting thank you for sharing awesome yes thank you thank you does anyone want to unmute themselves and tell us more about your fun activity No one wants to talk more about what they 
<laughs> That's okay. Okay. Going once, going twice, going on to the third question. Same process. And thank you, Marini, for your explanation. You did a way better job than I did. No, not at all. <laughs> actually, I actually wanted to say, I just forgot to unmute myself. Oh, I think, thanks. I think me. Omicron was on the way, was in the way as well. It wasn't just, mm -hmm. um, that's true. You know, it just kind of was suddenly we thought we were over everything and we're boosted mm -hmm. and everything. And then came Omicron and it was just really stifling. I think a lot of just even going outdoors was, you know, kind of not feeling completely safe because I went to the Baldwin yeah. Hills. There were so many people. It was a beautiful, shiny day after the rain, but it was a, there were a lot of people and it just Amen. doesn't feel anymore like so <laughs> safe to be with all yeah. these other people who are traveling. Yeah, that's, that's a good reminder that the holidays also probably didn't feel the same, right? Mm -hmm. My sister was out sick with COVID, so she couldn't, mm -hmm. we couldn't even see her. So yeah, I understand that winter break <laughs> was maybe not as eventful as we would have hoped because of our circumstances, but walks, finding little moments of joy are always helpful. Thanks, Farad. Okay, so speaking of the spring semester, what are you most looking forward to this spring semester? I'm gonna go ahead and do what Marini did and give you 20 seconds and then count you down. Okay, <laughs> three, two, one, post. Mm -hmm. Some good ones, connecting with students. I love the first one that I saw, for it to be over. <laughs> I think That's we can real. relate. It is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we can relate. Especially when you're trying to get grades in for winter and you're already a week into the new semester. <clears throat> Change, new growth, learning to be a good chair. Love that. Getting outside more. Reading new things. Spring break. Yes, I see a lot for spring break. I'm all about it. I love that we get those extra two days too, the Thursday and Friday before bonus days. Yes. A lot of people said spring break. I like that. Um, okay, I'm going to offer again, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and tell us more about what they're looking forward to. Well, I'll go. Um, I said, I'm really looking, I totally revamped my statistics class into statistics for social justice with a totally redone syllabus. And I'm really looking forward to teaching it, except I didn't get enough students. So we rescheduled it for a fourth week start. And I hope people encourage your students. It's gonna be so cool. Yeah. Bonnie was nice enough to share her syllabus with me and I thought it was magnificent. So magnificent that I asked if she could please do a, maybe like an informal workshop to talk through some of her choices. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, we get that going. Uh, I think we are planning that for some time in March. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, I think we have one or two more of these. Marini, do you wanna take this? Yes, one? sure. So it's always nice to look at things on a continuum. So, and, and we can also kind of commiserate with the things that we're not looking forward to this spring semester. And I often wonder what our students would say to respond to these questions too. And I have a feeling some of their responses will be pretty similar to ours. So, is there anything that you're not looking forward to this spring semester? So go ahead and think about your response. You will type it into the chat 
but don't quite hit enter yet. We'll give you 20 seconds and then a countdown. All right, so let's yeah. count down if we're ready in three, two, one, enter. <laughs> Allergies. Oh. Taking masks off, hot classes, computer glitches, hot weather, new COVID guidelines, getting COVID. Grading. Yep, that was what I put too, grading. <laughs> Oh, great. Not feeling behind. Another variant. Man, so real. End of the telecommute pilot. Students dropping classes. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Would anyone like to elaborate and unmute and tell us a little bit more about what they're not looking forward to? I can I can do it. Thanks. I only I see um, uh, Elise Jinx because Elise and I both put down the end of telecommute pilot, <laughs> and that, that's because part of it is um, for the past few months I've been enjoying a lighter commute, and so I like that the fact other people also doing telecommute may be out there, but when we get back to the regular rhythm, um, my commute is getting longer too, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for maybe people who don't know, <laughs> um, we had a telecommute pilot for our classified that allowed them to work from home. I think it was two days out of the week, maybe three. Yeah. And administrators so too, so classified and, and administrators. administrators. Right, and so, um, it's it's ending, I think, in March. Um, and so classified and administrators will now have to come back to campus five days out of the week. So what, instead why of is having it ending? It wasn't successful or what? Uh, no, it was not. It was a pilot project, I believe. I mean, administrators feel free to jump in, but my understanding is it was <laughs> not, never meant to be permanent. It's a pilot project to see and uh, they should conduct survey or uh, research about how it's going. So it's mm -hmm. going to end in, to end. Yes, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, uh, Vered. Okay, do we have another one of these? Let me see, I can't remember. No, okay. <laughs> Let me back up and just change my view here. Oh, sorry, when I hit escape, um, it doesn't do what I want it to do. Okay, so thank you again for sharing um, your responses to these questions. It's um, always nice to just kind of check in with each other first as uh, humans and as um, colleagues uh, before we get into the learning portion. Mm. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned at the start of our, our presentation here, um, last semester, I think many of you know that um, with the help of the Office of Institutional Effectiveness, uh, we put out a survey to learn more about how we were supporting our students during the pandemic and what we can do to improve services um, for our students. We had about 181 um, responses. The data folks will probably want me to say that students could um, submit more than one more than one time. So we just kind of have to keep that in mind. And so we've used their feedback to organize today's activities. Um, we also use that feedback for our leadership retreat back in December. Um, and so we're trying to you know really listen to our students um, and 
use their, their suggestions, their responses, their concerns, um, and be able to, to address them. So something um, that kind of a theme that emerged from the student survey and what we're centering our, our, our attention on today um, was communication. And so um, we'll see in these responses here that when we asked um, who would they most likely get help from, 70% said a professor, 49% said a counselor, 40, another 49% said um, a classmate, and 19% said a staff member, um, you know, followed by tutors and deans and librarians. Um, so we see obviously, you know, people who they might be interacting most with is the people who they say they are most likely to seek help from. But when we asked um, what has been challenging, this is the theme that uh, came up was that communication piece. So when they were able to select from a drop down menu, 29% um, said that getting in touch with a teacher uh, has been challenging and accessing campus resources, 34% said that that was challenging. Um, when they were able to write free responses um, that, that where they could sort of explain the challenges that they've, that they've um, been dealing with, communicating with professors and um, communicating with student services like um, financial aid, counseling, those were the two main areas where students said they would uh, reach out and not get a response back, or it would take too long to get a response back. So the thing that they needed help with that was really urgent had already passed. Um, we see that in the survey also, um, loneliness and anxiety about getting COVID were the top responses. And so I think it's also really important for us to be um, aware and sensitive to, to these issues, making sure that we know the mental health services that are available to students, um, that we are um, maybe talking about loneliness during these challenging times and talking about the real fear that, um, that we feel and our communities feel um, around COVID since it has affected black and brown communities um, more harshly than other communities. Sorry, I just wanted to, okay. Oh, a small, small response rate, I see Bonnie is saying. Um, yeah, full, in the past when we've tried to get responses from students, it's been um, way lower. <laughs> And so to have 181 responses was actually, um, in, in my experience, uh, quite a good response rate for what, for what we've experienced in the past. Okay. So why does this matter? Um, we feel that this is an equity issue. Numerous studies have shown that students of color and first-generation college students are less confident in their academic ability um, and more likely to avoid seeking help. So if our students are building up the courage to ask for help, to reach out to a professor, to reach out to a counselor um, or a staff member in one of our offices and um, they feel like they're not being, um, or like they might be ignored, um, then that is evidence, like that will immediately sort of turn them off. Um, it's evidence that maybe they don't belong here, maybe their question wasn't valid, um, maybe they should already know some of this stuff. Um, and so that's um, 
kind of the second bubble that you see. The RP group um, did a study back in 2013 and it showed that African-American participants and first-gen college students were more likely to report that others wanting them to succeed considerably impacted their success in college and their persistence from semester to semester. First-gen students particularly indicated that an instructor caring about them was important to their achievement and that the absence of this report influenced their decision not to return. I know that obviously we all wanna do the best thing for our students. In the chat, you saw that some of us are feeling overworked and stressed. Um, and so I know that many of us are trying to provide that nurturing environment. We want to be responsive, um, but the, surveys were, the survey responses were showing that um, at least the students who participated in the survey, uh, survey were not feeling that way, right? They're telling us that when they reach out, um, there is no response on the other end of that email um, or there's no one answering that phone. So um, that's something that we really just, a really practical piece that we wanted to focus in on and um, improve. Lastly, uh, students also said that staff uh, from administrative assistants to librarians to lab technicians played a key role in nurturing students by taking an interest in their success and providing assistance and support. So for our um, classified colleagues who are with us today, your um, role is uh, super important. Um, in nurturing our students and in um, sort of having the message that they are, that they belong here, that their success matters. Um, and so we're doing this all together. It's not just uh, people in the classroom. Marini? Yeah, so this next slide, the title really resonates. Equity is hard work. So think about that for a moment. Equity is hard work. So it's a play on words, obviously, thinking about equity is hard work done with the heart. So as Leslie mentioned, from the results of the student survey, a lot of students mention loneliness, anxiety, worry about getting COVID, not feeling like their needs are being um, responded to is really important. And that has a huge impact on their ultimate success and persistence. According to the National Equity Project, equity is reducing the predictability of who succeeds and who fails, interrupting reproductive practices that negatively impact students, and cultiv cultivating the gifts and talents of every student. So thinking about, um, you know, looking at things from more of an asset, asset based lens versus a deficit lens, thinking about all of the wealth, all of the positive attributes that our students have, right, whether it's resilience, balancing work, taking care of families, um, coming back to school, health issues, our students are trying to come back, they're trying to be present, they're trying to complete our classes. And so despite the challenges that they might bring to the class, they also bring so much knowledge and rich um, attributes that we need to try to center and focus on. Sometimes it's also helpful when we're thinking about a concept to think about what that thing is not. So equity is not a bag of tricks. So even though we've talked a lot about equity and we have different strategies for equitable instructional practices, and we're gonna talk about an equitable syllabus, today it's not just those finite or concrete things. It's not a checklist, right? These are things that we can do along our journey. And I like to think that equity is a journey and not a destination because sometimes I feel like I want to see what does this look like when we have finally arrived at equity 
you know, how will we know? And we may never fully know, but we will definitely try to pinpoint specific measurable outcomes with student feedback so that we can see ourselves making gains that are responsive to students' needs so that we can be approaching, you know, this journey of equity so that we can be closing these gaps and, you know, having our students feel cared for and that their needs are met and that they feel valued. Equity is not seeking equality. If you look at the image on the left, I'm sure many of you have seen that. There have been many different iterations of this cartoon. There have been criticisms of the cartoon, but I think that we can all kind of get behind what the message is trying to convey. Equality would be giving all of our students the same thing. We understand that our students have various needs. We need to differentiate the way that we serve our students and give them what they need. And so that means we have to learn about our students. We have to understand where they're coming from in order to be, to be able to provide them with what is going to benefit them. And equity is not being colorblind. So some of us may have grown up with this idea that, you know, everyone is the same. We don't see color, but we understand that that is actually detrimental because our students come with a variety of needs based on where they come from, based on their culture, based on their experiences. And so we need to we need to be compassionate and we need to meet students where they are. Yes, Bonnie, I agree. This is one of the best versions of the, of the graphic. They added that the liberation image, which is hopefully where we all wanna to get to where there aren't any barriers at all. And everyone has access to be in the game. And that's what we hope for and aspire to. Next slide. So one of the ways that we can kind of inch toward this equity journey is by creating SMART goals. And this is something that um, many of you maybe have heard of because we want to have concrete measurable ways to determine how are we reaching this thing, this equity thing that we've been talking about for years. Um, we still know that it's an issue. We still don't know that there are gaps, but how can we be, um, how can we be accountable, really? By 2023, West LA faculty will improve their equitable syllabus score by 25% so that they increase their communication with students. We have a similar goal for West LA staff, that they will improve their student-facing document score by 25% so that they increase their communication with students. So this will become clearer when we get into our breakout rooms and you take a look at the equitable syllabus checklist that was developed for our purposes. We understand that no one is perfect. This is all a journey and a work in progress. We know that you know, everyone is constantly uh, revising, reflecting, editing the more that we know the more that we change. I know that every year it seems like my syllabus gets longer and longer and then I stop and revise everything. And then I realize that I was doing something that maybe isn't the most equitable. And then I maybe change it with one syllabus but not the others because it's an arduous process. And so we all know that this is a work in progress and we want to create a safe space for us to be able to collaborate. But by creating these SMART goals, we can hold ourselves accountable and we'll be able to have data to measure our growth and our progress towards um, narrowing these equitable gaps, these equity gaps with our students. I don't know if we wanna check the chat and see. Mm. Sometimes I just wanna watch though, I wanna have the choice, absolutely. To be able to have the choice if you wanna play and if you wanna watch, that there are no barriers either way and that you have a choice to do what you want to do. Um, as Marini was kind of going over the SMART goals, I was um, thinking about in a recent Senate meeting, uh, there was a division who was um, presenting and they said something like, um, the old days of my way or the highway are over. <laughs> And um, now we're sort of, you know, trying to help students on a very individualistic level. 
seeing what they need and how we can help. And so there, I feel like there is, um, we've been talking about equity for so long. Equity existed on our campus even before Marini and I got here. Um, but I think we can kind of hear in the attitudes and the language that there is like a, a shift that this, this idea of equity is uh, permeating um, every division and that all together we can work towards um, hopefully eradicating those equity gaps. Okay, so I'm gonna have you think about this uh, question, going back to that communication piece. Um, I'll just give you kind of a minute to think about it. And then if you wanna use the chat to respond, we're gonna go ahead and do that. What messages do you want to communicate to our students? Um, if you had a group of students in front of you um, right now, uh, what would you want to tell them about you, about West? Um, what are the things you would want to say? I'm just gonna time us for one minute. Let you think about that. And then you can either use the chat or we can take a few um, comments. Have another 20 seconds. Okay. You can go ahead and continue posting your responses in the chat. I almost want to take these from the chat and like post them somewhere, do something with them. These are really excellent. Does anyone want to speak more to what they've written in the chat? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Leslie and Marini. Uh, this is Carlos. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, the comment that you made, Leslie, the, the, the comment that uh, back in the days we, we teach you and basically it's my way or the highway. Nowadays, I believe that we're in a different position. I wrote in the chat that um, we want to believe that we understand their struggles, all right? But oftentimes we need to hear from them. I'm, I'm suggesting and I'm trying to incorporate anonymous surveys to here, you know, see certainly mm -hmm. uh, providing a safe environment. But at the same time, I, I, I have the impression that that idea, my way of the highway, somehow was infil has infiltrated the young heads. So they are skeptical. They don't want to truly trust, you know, when we say that, that we want to hear honestly, you know, and, uh, and the communication don't go through. So there is still that impediment in between, you know how can we help and honestly let us know how, but unfortunately very often the message doesn't go through. Thank you. Yeah, that's, um, it's really interesting that you said like, it's, the, it's been infiltrated in their heads that um, it is my way or the highway, right? And depending on what kind of um, high school environment students came from, they might have been, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not socialized, but um, maybe indoctrinated. I don't know if that's too strong, but into this idea that a classroom, right, is uh, you sit in your neat rows, you stay quiet, you write your notes or you complete your worksheet and, um, and that's school, right? <laughs> And so students could um, resist 
when we ask them that we want them to participate, when we invite them to share their ideas um, and their experiences, um, they may not feel totally comfortable doing that yet. They, like you said, Carlos, maybe they don't trust that yet. Um, so I think it's up to us to kind of facilitate um, this new classroom where we are in partnership with each other. Um, we learn together, we co-create knowledge together and that we really want them to be um, in it with us. Um, and that's gonna take some, that's gonna take some time to, to build that trust. Uh, Nuala. Um, yeah, I think it's important to understand too that lots of the problems that we see in our classrooms, uh, there's a problem with education globally. When I speak to my students about what's going on in their home countries, it's really enlightening. And something that I've done is that I think we can have students co-create the curriculum with us. I mean, I, I know in my creative writing class, I've read like amazing stories and I've made them the subject of stories. And I've also used them in 101. Like, how can I explain that? You know, what, what sources can I use to show why the playing field is not evil, uh, you know, even why that there's that fence in that way. And I find it in student mm -hmm. stories and I make it the discussion of 101 and students really respond to that. And they, it makes them exceed their own expectations for themselves because they see others doing it. Like they really are um, the subject of an assignment, what somebody wrote. So. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tim, last comment here. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so I think it's kind of interesting that I didn't even need to really think about this. Like, like a lot, of, I'm a very deliberative person in a lot of ways. But when I heard this, it was instantly like a matter of belonging, because belonging is so much um, so important in like the student journey, um, and also. Um, uh, you know, like imposter syndrome is, you know, kind of a huge thing that's going on with a lot of our students. They don't think they belong here, just students in general, that they don't belong here, that they're not good enough, that they don't, they're, they're not college students. And once they start identifying as college students, they change in the way they address things. The other thing is that, um, that a lot of students feel like whatever the group that I identify with, doesn't belong here and and that you know that that you know even if uh, kind of cognitively um a lot of students um you know accept that that doesn't make sense um underneath the surface there's still a level of like uh you know what dweck would have described as stereotype threat right so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you tim um i had this uh, experience in my classroom this week um, where I had a student, her first, I, as you, a lot of you know, I teach as part of the Puente program. And so I had these students last semester, now they're with me again um, for English 103. And so last semester was the first semester for a lot of my students. And one of them on Tuesday, uh, she said that, you know, someone went, went up to her and asked her where, where a building was and she knew where it was and she felt so like tickled by that that like oh my gosh I know things about this campus um, and about being a college student and I'm able to help someone else now right and so she feels more like she belongs like this is her campus like she can um, you know be helpful to another student um, and so I just wanted to share that because you reminded me of that, Tim, where students need to feel like they belong. That's why we have uh, programs um, like Puente. That's why we're, you know, trying to, um, that's why we have the, the BSU in the works. And so the message is super clear. We want that message to be really clear. Next. Um, we won't pause and discuss this, but you can just sort of start thinking. Um, so if that's what we want to communicate, all of the wonderful things that we talked about and that you put in the chat, um, now we wanna think about what messages um, do you think our syllabi and our student facing documents are really sending to our students, right? And the activity that we're about to engage in 
um, we'll have a series of questions that will allow us to um, examine some of those messages that are either explicit or implicit that may not be um, matching with what we really want to say, what we really want to communicate. Um, so this, is, uh, this has been adapted from the uh, USC, my little dashboard is blocking the actual name, but it's Center for uh, Urban Education. It's a protocol that um, was developed by them. Um, so we're, we do an analysis like the one that we're about to do. Um, we can start to see what is explicitly stated and presented in a document. And this can reveal the messages being transmitted um, and the relative importance of those. Documents can be analyzed for what they implicitly communicate about the aims of education, who belongs and or does not belong in the campus community, what qualities must be demonstrated to be fully included and more. Such an analysis frames uh, documents as artifacts of practice that are embedded with taken for granted attitudes, assumptions, some things and norms. Um, so obviously that sense of belonging that we were just discussing, um, you know, is that being sort of communicated in our, in our documents and in our syllabi? Okay, I wanna, I wanna, I want there to be enough time for me to give you at least a little five minute um, break in between now and the time that we go into the breakout rooms. So here is just a preview of the questions that you will be um, using as a guide to do this analysis. Um, I'm just gonna kind of leave it up here if you want to uh, preview them. But for now, I'm gonna give us a break until 11 o'clock. Okay, so you can go grab more coffee, um, have a snack, and then we'll meet back here at 11 and we'll go into the breakout rooms then. Arnita, can the questions be dropped? You will have them in a, you'll have access to them in, in just a minute, but let me see if I could, let me see if I could do that for you. Oops. See? Chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, that. That pasted funky, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I hope that's kind of helpful, Arnita. And then, oh no, I don't have a PDF. Um, Leslie, you had sent us that survey that had the same questions. Would that mm -hmm. work? Could you send something like that again? Yes, and that's what we're, yeah, that's what we're about to share when we go into the breakout rooms. Okay. So we'll, yeah, yeah. So they'll see thanks, it. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, mm -hmm. they'll see it. Yeah. And if you haven't already, if you can also um, edit your name so that you have your division at the front of your name. We're gonna use that to create breakout rooms. Many, many of you have already done that, thank you.
Raquel, let me put up the slide that shows you how to change your name. So on the PowerPoint, it kind of walks you step by step. And I grab coffee myself. We'll be back. Just have one more minute. Okay. <clears throat> we are here. I hope those uh, little seven minutes gave you an opportunity to um, take a little break. And um, we're going to come back together and hop into those breakout rooms. Let me give you an overview and then I'll put some links in the chat for you that you'll be needing. Um, okay, so like I said, you'll be uh, grouped with members of your division and some uh, breakout rooms when there was may maybe only one or two people in the division, we've combined you so you have a few more thought partners. Um, together, you will use the document review tool or the equitable syllabus tool to examine your own syllabus or document. 
And then we'll come back to this main room to share insights and highlights. And as always, have fun. I'm going to um, I'm going to put a let me stop share. And I'm going to put a link in the chat that you'll need for this activity. So the link that I'm going to put in the chat is um, to a Google slide. And I'll show you what that looks like when you click on the link. Um, you should see something like this. OK. There are some additional instructions, a little more specific, in the um, second slide. And I see lots of people already on. And um, the slides are in alphabetical order. So you can go ahead and find your divisions slide. You'll have access to the equity dashboard. I've linked it. And so you're gonna first look at what are the equity gaps in your division? Have you um, visited these in a while? Um, what's the difference in success rates between white and black students um, or white and Latinx students? And then why do you think these gaps exist still, even with all the work that we're doing? So that's gonna be first. And then you'll move into the document review or the, um, or the syllabus review. So when you click on this link, you will be taken to a survey for our faculty, um, since you're gonna be sort of self-directed, um, the way that I envision this going is that you would take one question at a time, have a discussion as a group, and then individually respond to the question. The score that we receive from these surveys is what we're gonna use as our benchmark. And hopefully in a year after more professional learning and collaborating, our score will increase um, by at least 25%. Um, Nuala, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, point out that, and I know you probably already know this, that all the US Department of Education statistics show Asians excelling more than whites and then any other racial group. And they're a small, small minority group at 5.8% of the US population. And I think maybe some questions in here about the definition of whiteness expanding, like what it means would be helpful. Um, mm. Because it's, yeah, it's a white black issue, but it's so complex. And um, that's just my feedback. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, race is complex since it's imaginary and we've created it to organize ourselves and to keep some people at top and others at the bottom. Well, the, so, the gap is between Asian and white students and then Asian and white students and Hispanic and black students. And it's really fascinating what's happening now. That definition, it's called white supremacy with a tan. So just- right. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. All right. And you'll, have, you'll actually have the power or the ability to toggle between even Asian students, if that's what you want to look at, and other subgroups. Um, so yeah, you can also maybe investigate that if you have time. Well, I'm just passionate about it. And like for the first time at a UC, you have more Latinx students than any other students. Who's at the bottom still always? Black students. And the gap is growing mm. between Latinx mm. and, and Black students. So they're the number one target of institutional yeah. racism, classism, you name it, it's thrown at them. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes, let's get to the activity. I'm gonna, oh, uh, let's see. Mary Jo, can you open Are you ready up for me to open the breakout the room? rooms? Yeah, thank you okay. so much. Here we go, we'll have until about 12.05. And Tim, I saw your question, let me work on that. There's one person I didn't get to assign because I just um, they didn't rename themselves and I don't know them. Bertha Lopez. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Bertha. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Bertha is classified. I just put her in the room, Mary Jo. Thank you so much. And then someone else sure. just joined and I don't know who they are either. <laughs> so feel free to move people around as needed. Yeah. <clears throat> Mary Jo, sorry, um, I, I named myself because accurately, but to, to act as a, a model for others, but I'm gonna join the classified people to help Elise. Please go ahead. You can, you can do it yourself, right? Uh, I can't, but Elise, I think just. I just okay, moved. perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. I also put the administrators in their own room. Oh, you did? Well, okay. now there's only one left. So. <laughs> it's Edna. Should we move them? How about you? Oh, she, where'd she go? I think and she, I guess Leslie? College? Yes, hi. It's, it's Nancy, hi. I was, hi, Nancy. Zoom bounced me out. Um, oh. So I guess I'm CIS and our basic skills. The okay, we'll put you in college you. and career prep. Okay. I need a college and career prep slide. I don't know how Should I, I missed move, it. Should um, I move Edna into classified? Uh, she put sure. herself under classified, so I'm going to put her in there. Okay. I can't hear you. No. <clears throat> I'm on Alisa Science. Let me see. Let me. Oh. Oh, okay. Some rooms are empty, so don't put them in those. Yeah, and you can see the ones that get combined. Okay, yeah. Let me copy. What do I do? Oh, Marsha, um, which um, which department are you from? I'm on the health sciences, but I have ignore my phone. I'm I can hear better with my phone than my computer, so I just use it as a. Okay, so you have a probably a join room button. I am in way. the room, but I can't hear anything there. I'm going to have to close my phone, I guess. I don't know. I don't see you. That's weird. I'm here. I'm okay. in the room. I'm going to have to Great. turn my phone off because it's. I'm using my computer, too. And I'm on the computer, but my... <sighs> Let me try my computer. I'll just close this. I'll just close my phone down. Okay. So Elisa and Margo, they're in rooms, but they just have to join them. Okay. 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 Thank you so much for that. There's no way I could have done it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like I knew a lot of the names and I was messaging Vicky, I'm like, who's this? What room? <laughs> where do these people go? And she looked them up for me. So, um, the group okay. So I'm going to, I have to run off. So you can, Yep. I have control of breakout room now, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you. This is great. What I got Thank here. you. Okay. Yay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, might want to pause the recording too. I can start. Um, in our group, we looked at <clears throat> we we looked at the uh, the equity dashboard, and it was interesting. And we spec we focused on fall twenty to fall twenty one, and just mm -hmm. to see the change in enrollments and their success rates, it was it was let's say baffling to kind of see that there was a change, um, but just looking at the drop in enrollment in one case and then increase in enrollment, but then their success rate. So we were really trying to figure out what could have been the cause. And a lot of our rationale or reasoning came back from COVID, of course, and the, just the external, um, external situations the students have to deal with. So really, you know, as a, a, a division that provides academic support, instructional support, you know, it's like, how do we reach out and connect, personally connect with the students. So let's say the masses of students, so they know that there's a, um, a safe space. There's a place mm -hmm. that they can always come to get that support versus feeling um, left out. And as you said, like mm -hmm. I said earlier, as a support entity, you know, we expect, we can advertise for students, but we expect them to come to us versus as would, um, I'm gonna say the faculty have, you know, you signed up for my class. So they're gonna automatically mm -hmm. come to class versus, hey, let me connect with a tutor so that I can feel comfortable, or let's say with uh, someone in the learning center or a non-credit instructor, you know, feel comfortable enough to go to them when they have those questions versus um, I got to wait till I roll in the person's class to actually connect to somebody that can give me support. 
Right. And I think, um, and Lisa, right. did you want to ask? You know what I... oh. oh, Lisa, you were in our group too, or other group members, <laughs> if I wanted to add something. Well, I think that's I good, just, Tim. Yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to call out something that I heard Tim say, which was we. Mm -hmm. We, right? Like, what can we do mm -hmm. to make sure that our students are successful? And I, I love that the language, there's a shift happening from like what they do or don't do. Right. The responsibility is on us as, as educators, as classified educators, um, <coughs> to, to help to make sure that students are getting the information and the support that they need. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Tim. Okay. Who is next? Tiffany. Okay, I can share out for our group. Um, Thank you. We looked at the equity dashboard um, and we followed the questions where we were comparing black students to white students, Hispanic students. We also looked at Asian, we looked at Pacific Islander, um, indigenous, because uh, that data was there as well. And what we found consistently was that there were definite equity gaps when it came to course success. But when we looked at the other two um, measurements, what was it, course retention? And enrollment. And enrollment, which there were gaps there in terms of the size of population, but the retention rates were actually really similar to one another. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see mm -hmm. these significant differences. Um, so that was an interesting thing to note that the biggest gaps for our division is really looking at um, success, which I think is the most important one because that's the whole point of them being here is being successful and earning these credits. So that was an interesting um, thing to note. Um, we also mm -hmm. noticed that, you know, for the campus overall, but definitely for our division, the number of um, Pacific Islander students and, and indigenous students was really low. And in a lot of cases, there weren't even enough students to um, post data. And for a division like our own, we're the social science division, we're sociology, we're history, you know, um, we're the division that you would think would really attract um, a lot of those students, students from those populations. So we thought that was something that we could really look at, um, you know, why aren't we attracting more of those students to our campus in general, um, but also to our division in particular. Hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing. I know the chat is, um, active, and I, I wish I could stop and read all of it, but with 15 minutes left, I want to continue. Um, thank you for sharing those insights, uh, Tiffany and friends. Who is next? I can share a little bit. And please, you know, any other classifieds in the room, feel free to jump in. Um, we, we looked at a couple of um, applications. Um, and I think what we noticed was that they were, um, when they came from the district specifically, they were um, kind of scary, honestly. I mean, Vicki commented that it looked like an application for her mortgage. One of the applications, I don't recall if it was for, um, the athletics or something, something else that we discussed, but it was about 10 pages long. And then the last question was, is, you know, is English your primary language? And it was like, well, that probably should have been addressed, <laughs> um, you know, on page one, or there should have been options. Um, and uh, we did notice that it centered on the applications, especially it asked for, you know, mother's name, father's name. Someone brought up the fact that, you know, that's centering, you know, heteronormative relationships. What if you don't have um, one of those? And that so immediately, it's off-putting um, to our uh, minoritized students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Elise. Um, yeah, if we're trying to make our forms um, accessible, readable, approachable to our students, we really need to use language um the language needs to reflect 
write those messages and it seems like it's not yet. So something to work on. Uh, can we hear from a few other groups? I can talk about science. Oh, thanks, Red. Okay. So uh, for science, we saw that we have a 20% gap for Black students and 15 for Hispanic. And we were trying to talk about um, what we think might be some of the um, some of the um, explanation for that. And we thought that maybe, um, you know, we're kind of like slowly moving from maybe the way that the department used to be, you know, uh, run for a long time that there was kind of like a, either you, or you are cut for science or not, you know, or something like that kind of attitude. And we feel like, you know, we're slowly moving there, but we need to do more of increasing our flexibility, uh, given, you know, more support and also uh, maybe intervention. We, we need to do a lot more intervention uh, and, and basically notice when students are not active, notice when students are not doing well, and then, you know, intervene early to, to uh, bring them back in. And, uh, you know, at least the, the, some of us that tried that, it's been very, very helpful and very successful. And we were able to, you know, when doing that, um, increase definitely uh, the rate of success and you know retention and so on. So that's kind of you know a goal maybe we, uh, we should set for ourselves uh, as a division. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll also be sharing the link for that uh, syllabus review if you want to share it with other folks in your division or encourage them to look at their syllabi um, and kind of you know do this review on their own, it'll really help us um, gather data and understand like what are the areas where we still need to uh, focus in on and improve. Um, so thanks for that, Barad. I think we have time for one or two more share outs. Uh, this is Carlos from Health Sciences. And um, I just want to share that we were looking at the dashboard. We First, we started a conversation on the syllabus. I mislead the group to different discussions, basically. But we address the issues with the syllabus, and then we look into the dashboard, and we realize that there is a lot of data missing there. So I'm curious to know how is this data, who is collecting this data? And I will definitely, we have our division meeting coming up next week, and I will really encourage our programs and, 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 and disciplines to start collecting our own data, because uh, we do it in some of, uh, in some of those. I, I know that dental hygiene is, some, is a program that we have, not only we collect, but we have to as part of the report to the Commission mm -hmm. on Dental Accreditation. But looking to the dashboard, uh, disciplines such as kinesi kinesiology, kinesiology athletics, where we know there are a, a high um, number of black students, there is zero data in there. So um, definitely we need to figure it out how to better track mm -hmm. across the board, you know, this, this information. And we will try to do our best in within our disciplines and programs to track that as well. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So you're saying that the, the data for black students wasn't available in kinesiology? It's zero, huh. there is no, no data. Kinesiology athletics, zero as well. Okay, no maybe a question for our, our new dean of institutional effectiveness. So thank you, Carlos. You're welcome. And our last group, who wants to share insights, highlights? I can share quickly for our human development and family studies group. We looked at the dashboard. We, I think we spent more time talking about the syllabus checklist, but for the dashboard, we kind of went more into detail with question number four, why do these gaps exist? So with the three different subgroups we saw disparities from between 13% with our um, Hispanic students to 20% disparity with Black students. So we were kind of brainstorming what are some reasons why these gaps exist. And I mean, I know that th these lists can be exhaustive. So some of the ones that we talked about were, um, you know, one person in our group talked about studies that say Latino males, for example, may be reluctant to seek help. 
um, that they should be able to be able to figure out things on their own based on some studies, some of some of those cultural differences. Uh, students not seeing their own cultures reflected in their in the faculty or even their age reflected in the faculty. Um, unconscious bias perpetuating stereotypes, lack of resources for minority students and lack of school resources to address these issues. Um, BIPOC students tending not to have access to the same social capital as white students. Um, we also talked about lack of school readiness. So students coming to classes that maybe don't have prerequisites, not having um, basic reading or writing skills that make it a little bit difficult for them to be successful. And so then the faculty have to make sure that they prepare those students a little bit differently to help maximize and bridge those skills. So those were some of the things that we talked about. And then we had a really, really good discussion, I think, for most of the rest of the hour about the questions on the checklist. And so we talked about everything from our late policies and the wording in our syllabus and do we coddle our students too much or too little? How do we um, make sure that our students are held to high standards, but that we're also being empathetic to their individual situations and needs? And we talked about, you know, to what extent do we put um, late policy or um, any policies in the syllabus that maybe aren't explicit, but that we would kind of off, um, that we would accept, but they're not on the record. And so we talked about the messages that that can send for some students who maybe take what you write on your syllabus as face value. And we'll say, okay, well, there's no late work accepted um, versus students who say, I know it says no late work, but I'm gonna advocate. And you know, I know that I can talk to my instructor and then they get the benefit of being able to turn in something late. So that further, um, right. that further broadens that equity issue. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about whether or not we give, um, we make we make answers available after students take tests. Um, we talked about how we give tests. I mean, we talked about so much stuff. It was a really, yeah. it was a really enlightening discussion. And I think the main thing that we said was we all had room to grow because we went question by question and all, not all of our answers were yeses. So we definitely have room to grow to, to try to make that 25% in a year. And I think, um, the main message that we walked away with was that we're all reflective practitioners, or at least we are endeavoring to be so. And so the fact that we're thinking about it and we're talking about it, we're open and willing to grow and learn and change. Some of us, while we were talking, are saying, okay, I'm going to make this change for my, you know, my late start class. I'm going to make this change in my mm -hmm. syllabus. So I think it was a really, really valuable discussion for us. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Marini. We're in a constant uh, state of revision. Um, and so I wanted to read this really quickly. I was lurking on your slides as you were uh, completing them. And uh, Marini, you mentioned like a slew of reasons why these equity gaps exist. And I particularly liked the, the way that this one was phrased um, and not just because it came from my division. Uh, so it says, racist structures in our society are prevalent and systemic, and they are not simple to break down. We need to put all of our effort into struggling against them and expect the struggle to be ongoing. Whew. So thank you for struggling uh, today with, uh, with me, with us. Um, we will continue to struggle, um, but it is obviously the greatest struggle. Um, what I want to share with you as we continue our equity efforts, this discussion, um, on February 25th, Dr. Frank Harris uh, will be um, hosting a talk on becoming an anti-racist institution. Um, there is a registration link already. Um, I'll be sending that out to you so you can um, register on the VRC. Um, classified as always are uh, welcomed and encouraged to participate. They were our biggest breakout group today. Um, so that is awesome. I'm gonna stop share. And I'm also going to post in the chat just that, um, equitable syllabus review. So you can copy that, you can 
send it to your teacher friends, share it at a division meeting so we can get um, as many responses this semester. And I think with that right on time, I'm going to um, uh, break, we'll break for today. I hope you all have a really, really nice weekend.